If you've been enjoying the Panorama podcast, you can subscribe to it on your favorite podcast app. If you do, please consider giving us a review on Apple Podcasts or Google Play. Positive reviews really do help. You can also support us directly at patreon.com slash panorao or check out our website at panorao.com. There, you'll find direct links to the podcast, articles, and news about upcoming Panorao projects. In addition, check out our YouTube channel. You can find all the episodes of this podcast, as well as other Panorao content, there. And now, on to the show. Welcome to the Panorao Podcast with Dr. Lupu. I'm Matt Lupu. I'm very excited to be able to tackle today's episode, because this episode serves to answer a listener's question. I always like it when I can answer anybody's questions. But when listeners do write in with specific questions, especially well-thought-out ones, it's an absolute pleasure for me to be able to answer them. The question our listener wrote is as follows. How should we understand the modern atheist world when the whole history of humanity has been developed and influenced by so many beliefs and religions? How did the modern world become atheist, or has it always been so? Is science and technology the next religion? Perhaps I shouldn't have promised to answer this question as much as explore it. There's certainly quite a bit in here, and I think the best way to handle this is to break it up into little chunks, so why don't we take them as they come? Well, first off, how did the modern world become atheist? I don't really think it is. I can certainly understand the sentiment that this listener is expressing. Sometimes it can feel like belief is on the decline. If you live in the Western world, and by that I mean the United States, Canada, Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, etc., this feeling may be more or less pronounced. In doing the research for this episode, I decided to indulge my curiosity and try and find some hard numbers to support this vague feeling that I have, that society has become less religious over the course of my lifetime. According to PewResearch.com, the number of people identifying as Christians in the United States is declining, and declining rapidly. For example, currently, 43% of U.S. adults identify with Protestantism. That number is down from 51% in 2009. And only one in five adults are Catholic. That number is down from 23%, also in 2009. Meanwhile, all subsets of the religiously unaffiliated population, a group known as the religious nuns, the people that don't identify with any particular organized religion, have seen their numbers swell. But it isn't just in Christianity. Ideas about God and morality have traditionally been very tightly correlated. That is to say, in previous generations, the assumption was that for somebody to be moral, he or she had to believe in God. That seems to no longer be the case at all. Again, according to Pew Research, only 15% of those in France who were polled say that it is necessary to believe in God in order to be moral. The numbers are similarly small throughout the rest of Western Europe. For example, in Sweden, only 9% of respondents thought that belief in God was a prerequisite for morality. The numbers are slightly higher in the rest of the quote-unquote Western world, but only slightly. Canada stands at 26%. The U.S. is the highest at 44%. This is surprising, because the numbers were quite a bit higher only 10 years ago, everywhere. We could imagine if such a poll were conducted in the middle of the 19th century, I would suspect the numbers to be close to 100% in many of these same countries. Now all of this said, there are many countries in the world, still, that don't feel this way at all, nor do they deal with the same kind of downward trends in religiosity. These countries exist predominantly in the developing world. For example, in Nigeria, 
93% of those polled said it was necessary to believe in God in order to be moral and have good values. In Indonesia, that number was 96%. Unfortunately, there is no polling data for the Middle East, but I think we might hazard a guess in places like Saudi Arabia and Iran, the numbers would be similarly high. So I don't think it's quite fair to say that the modern world is uniformly atheist. It would seem that the question is better asked in this way. Why is it that religiosity in all its forms seems to be on the decline in the Western world? This leads us to a further question. Why is there such a great difference between the Western world and those other countries in the Middle East and South Asia? Why is the rate of religiosity so markedly different between these two different parts of the world? I have several theories as to why we might see a decline in this kind of religiosity. But before we go on, I want to try and clean up the question a little bit. And perhaps we should start with the term atheist and see if we can't define that a little bit better. The term atheist, for the most part, doesn't have particularly good press. In lots of cases, the word atheist brings up all sorts of negative connotations. Part of the reason for that is because of its association with certain political ideologies that proclaim themselves to be officially and proudly atheist. Perhaps the most famous example of this would be the Marxist ideology espoused by countries like the Soviet Union and China in the years after World War II. Every Soviet satellite country and every other country ascribing to a Marxist socialist regime was particularly concerned with forming itself into a perfectly atheistic society. Part of the reason for that was because people like Karl Marx and Frederick Engels grew up in a time and in a place when the church still had a very tight grip on society, which had largely been the case since the medieval period. Marx himself was the one who famously coined the phrase that religion is the opium of the masses. Marx, and the socialists that would follow him, largely felt that organized religion would actively prevent the socialist revolution that they so badly desired. They also felt that religion was a necessary evil, but entirely untrue, something that was designed to keep people pacified and comfortable, in the same way that you would give opium to a sick or injured person. As a result of the Marxist view towards religion, religiosity among many, many different groups of people living inside of the Soviet socialist republics would decline. One of the reasons that atheism has such a negative connotation in the United States is precisely because of its connection with the U.S.'s traditional enemy after World War II. That is to say, the USSR and communism more broadly. In an effort to differentiate U.S. society from the evil, imperial, atheistic, world communist conspiracy, the United States preferred to view itself as a moral, God-fearing society. I think at least in part because of this difference in messaging throughout the Cold War, the United States remains markedly more religious than the rest of those countries that we were talking about earlier, the ones in Western Europe and throughout the rest of the Anglosphere. Well, now that we've defined the limits of this so-called modern atheistic society, we have to grapple with a more complicated question. What does our listener mean when she says atheism? Coming up with a coherent definition for what atheism is, is rather difficult. That's because atheism exists in opposition to theism. I always found this oppositional relationship to be particularly confusing. For example, if you were to imagine a shop, and then we were to imagine that some sort of craft or practice happens inside of this shop, oh, I don't know, I'll pick butcher. Can we then come up with some sort of shop next door that does the opposite of this practice? Maybe a simpler way to ask this question is to rephrase it, what is the opposite of a butcher? I don't think there is one. For there to exist an opposite of a butcher, you would have to have some kind of person that took small chunks of meat and then somehow reassembled them together over and over again until they resurrected whatever animal that the meat came from. I don't think there is such a thing as the opposite of a butcher. And here, as I see it, is our problem. 
The term atheist is derived from Greek. The original Greek word was atheos. And the way that Greek works is that if you have a noun, you can place an a in front of it to mean without. For any other classicist listening, we call that an alpha privative. So you can see, clearly, if you start with the Greek word for God, theos, and then add an alpha privative in front of it, you are now left with a term meaning without God, a theos. And this is all well and good when we're speaking pedantically about ancient Greek. But in practical terms, an atheist seems to be a person who doesn't believe in God. But it's not quite that simple. Much in the way that you can't come up with the opposite of a butcher, I don't think it's fair to say that you can come up with the opposite of somebody who believes in Christianity, or Judaism, or Islam. I should note here that I'm not the first person to have noted this problem. In fact, many other philosophers have recognized it and tackled it with much more vigor than I could possibly do in this episode of the podcast. Therefore, in order to find workarounds, other terminology was invented to describe somebody who is either partially or fully skeptical about the existence of God. Some examples. The irreligious. The agnostic. The non-theist. Etc., etc. All of these terms serve to describe a person or a group of people who are either somewhat or totally skeptical about the existence of God or gods. Let's keep this range of definitions in mind and fold them together under this broad heading of atheism. That should do the trick for the rest of this episode. Now that we have some clarity about our terms and definitions, maybe we can start tackling what the difference has been historically between Western Europe and the rest of the world. In true Panarao style, I think that it would be helpful for us to roll the clock back as far in time as we can and examine what those first quote-unquote atheists believed and thought. Before I do that, though, I'd like to add one final proviso. My background is in ancient history and the classical languages Greek and Latin. For that reason, I'm going to limit my discussion to the earliest instances of what we might conceive of as atheism in the Greco-Roman world. That's not to say that there weren't equally ancient atheistic philosophies floating around in places like India. There certainly were. It's just to say that I'm almost totally ignorant of them. With that said, if we broadly take the word atheism and understand it to mean, at the very least, skepticism about God or gods, where can we find the oldest example of such skepticism? To answer that question, we need to examine a group of thinkers known as the pre-Socratic philosophers. These pre-Socratics largely flourished in the 6th century BC. As their name implies, they predate Socrates. If we imagine the society that these pre-Socratics would have grown up in, we might imagine a pre-industrial agricultural economy. Certainly, in a society like the one we're talking about, literacy would have been a rarity, but still, it did exist. The major literary works that were read by all literate Greeks at the time were predominantly works of poetry, and even more specifically, two poets, at least that we know of, Hesiod and Homer. In fact, most of what we know about Greek mythology comes from these two very authors. These poets and their descriptions of the relationships between gods and men became so famous and so ubiquitous that their works acquired a religious flavor. For the rest of antiquity, that is to say, from the time that we're talking about now, up until when Christianity becomes the dominant religion in Europe, people will use passages from the Iliad and the Odyssey to cast spells. Certain passages were known to have had healing properties and were prescribed by physicians to help patients recovering from injury and illness. 
other passages would be sung during religious festivals. There were even competitions to see who could memorize the most and who could chant for the longest. It's really hard to overstate how central these texts were to ancient society at the time. To the layman, these texts contained all of the information that a person needed about the world. However, to those aristocrats who were literate, certain problems would arise upon examining the works of Hesiod and Homer. These philosophers found that perhaps the books in front of them did not contain all of the information that a person needed to live their life. One example of an aristocratic philosopher from this time period was a man named Xenophanes. He famously said, quote, The gods have not, of course, revealed all things to mortals from the beginning, but rather, seeking in the course of time, they discover what is better. I take that to mean that divine revelation has not perfected human knowledge. I think that the they that Xenophanes uses in the second part of that quotation refers to men, not to gods, meaning that in the course of time, men will discover things that are better, better even than what was presumably divinely revealed. Here's another quote from the same philosopher. Yet with respect to the gods and what I declare about all things, no man has seen what is clear, nor ever will any man know it. For even should he chance to affirm what is really existent, he himself does not know it, for all is swayed by opining. I take this quotation to mean that no one person has a monopoly on knowledge. The traditional view of poets like Hesiod and Homer was that their knowledge was perfect, that their literature was the sum total of human achievement, and that we should probably stop trying to compete with them. Xenophanes sought to convince his students that new knowledge was still out there, just waiting to be discovered. If the gods were real, and they had divinely appointed the poets, Hesiod and Homer, to transmit everything that was necessary for a person to know, then new advancement and new understanding would be, by definition, impossible. But that certainly was not the case. It would have been readily apparent, even at such an early date, that technologies and human ingenuity are not fixed, but are constantly engaged in a long, arduous process of incremental improvement. One need only look at the style of temples built in the 6th century BC and compare them to the ruins of older civilizations to see that things do change, and oftentimes they change for the better. But Xenophanes goes further in his skepticism when it comes to divine revelation. This next quotation is perhaps his most famous one. He says, if cattle and horses and lions had hands, or could paint with their hands and create works such as men do, horses like horses and cattle like cattle also would depict the gods' shapes and make their bodies of such a sort as the form they themselves have. What Xenophanes is saying here is that perhaps if cattle and horses built temples, their gods would look just like cattle and horses. And perhaps since human beings actually have built temples with images of the gods, then maybe, just maybe, those images take a human shape because of their inventors rather than because of any kind of empirical understanding of the true form of the gods. After all, why should gods look like people at all? If we're talking about supernatural beings that don't live on the same plane of reality or on the same planet as the rest of us, then how should we know what they look like? And isn't it very convenient that we, as ancient Greeks, just so happen to think that gods look like better-looking versions of ourselves? So, is it safe to call Xenophanes an atheist? I don't think so.
I don't think that when we say atheism, we mean skepticism, although Xenophanes certainly was a skeptic. There were other examples of quote-unquote atheism, though the most famous of which would probably be the example of Epicurus, the founder of the so-called Epicurean school. Epicurus was an atomist. This school of philosophy believed that all matter could be reduced down to an uncuttable particle known as the atom. Notice again here the use of the alpha privative with the word for cut, tomos. The atomists were revolutionary in their ideas because they were the first to postulate that all events occurred around us completely naturally and that there was no need for the unseen hand of the gods to make the wind blow or a volcano erupt or to bring a winter storm. Epicurus and his Epicurean school of philosophy did not completely deny the existence of gods. Rather, the Epicureans believed that the gods existed in some sort of very remote, almost untouchable, spiritual plane. Epicurus himself was rather insistent that the gods must exist. It was only their role in natural and man-made events that he questioned. Epicurus will become more important later on, but for now, I'd like to jump to my next incredibly famous example. This one comes from The Apology by Plato. The Apology, of course, is that famous work that records the trial of Socrates. Socrates would do much to synthesize various philosophies that existed before him, specifically the philosophies of the pre-Socratics, and distill them down into his own style of teaching. His most famous student, Plato, would continue this distillation, founding the Platonic Academy. It's hard to overstate the importance of the Academy in the history of ideas, at least in the Western world. At any rate, Socrates, by all accounts, must have been an incredibly annoying figure. We're talking about a philosopher who would have wandered around getting into arguments with random people in an attempt to get his interlocutor to admit that they don't know what they're talking about. Unfortunately for Socrates, this style of argumentation eventually resulted in serious charges filed against him by the Athenian government. In the Apology, Socrates uses his so-called Socratic method to goad the chief prosecutor in his trial into accusing him of being an atheist. The chief prosecutor takes the bait and says, That's what I'm saying. You don't acknowledge the gods at all. But does he really say that? There's quite a bit of controversy over this line. I'll spare you the Greek, but suffice it to say that some scholars take this line to mean that Socrates has no respect for the gods, while others believe that the operative word, nomidsane, should be translated as believe. That is to say, Socrates does not believe the gods are real. It's not just a matter of him not acknowledging or respecting them. Because of this ambiguity in the Greek, it's hard to know what the meaning of the sentence actually is. I, along with many other scholars, take it to mean that the chief prosecutor is telling Socrates he doesn't believe in any gods at all. In the conversation to follow, Socrates will say, but that's nonsense, of course. I believe in the gods. And then he provides multiple examples of him worshipping at temples, and so on and so forth. But this, perhaps, is the first instance we can point to where atheism, meaning a disbelief in the gods, is defined and regarded as clearly a negative attribute. In fact, this charge of atheism would continue to have criminal implications for centuries thereafter. For example, when Epicurus's work would eventually be translated into Latin during the latter years of the Roman Republic, his Roman translator and champion Lucretius would take great pains to clarify his position regarding atheism. Lucretius made it very clear in his work, De Rerum Natura, which was largely based on Epicurus's original, that the gods are indeed real, but that they're over-relied upon as an ideology.
that natural phenomena are over-attributed to them when in fact the true causes are the atoms. One of the reasons that Epicurus is so adamant about this point is because atheism, as we understand it, in the modern sense of the term, a disbelief in the gods, and not just healthy skepticism, was still quite shocking and continued to carry harsh penalties. For example, in the Roman Empire, the emperor Domitian is said to have killed many of his close friends and associates on a variety of trumped-up charges. In one particular case, Domitian killed a man named Flavius Clemens, who was a consul, even though he was a cousin and was married to Flavia Domitilla, who was also a relative of Domitian's. The charge was atheism. Cassius Dio, an author writing in Greek during the latter end of the Roman Empire, recounts the scene, telling us that this charge of atheism was a charge on which many others who drifted into Jewish ways were condemned. I remember when I first stumbled upon this use of the word atheism. I was shocked and not a little bit horrified when I came to the conclusion that atheism, at least in classical antiquity, could mean not believing in the correct gods or believing in different gods. Interestingly enough, this charge of atheism, similar to the one that Domitian makes against his relatives, will eventually come to be made against the Christians as Christianity begins to spread and become more popular throughout the Roman Empire. One particular emperor recorded his feelings about the Christians. His name was Julian, and we know him as Julian the Apostate. He writes in a work known as Against the Galileans, quote, For they, that is, the Christians, have not accepted a single admirable or important doctrine of those that are held either by us Hellenes or by the Hebrews, who derive them from Moses, But from both religions, they have gathered what has been ingrafted, like powers of evil, as it were, on these nations, atheism from the Jews, an assorted and slovenly way of living from our indolence and vulgarity. In much of Julian's extant writings, he will refer to Christians time and time again as atheists. This is because Julian sees the Judeo-Christian God and the brand new worship of said God to be a modern invention, lacking in the pedigree that traditional Greco-Roman religion carried with it. In the Roman mind, the older that something was, the more respected and revered it must be. When something new is made, it is reflexively treated with skepticism and oftentimes hostility. For those reasons, the birth of a new religion would appear, to an emperor trained in philosophy like Julian was, as a kind of atheism, a disbelief in the traditional Roman gods, and its turning towards something new and unvetted that clearly didn't have the same type of cultural or historical power that the traditional gods would have had. Certainly then, this form of atheism, the kind that we find in Socrates and Julian, is not the kind of atheism that we're talking about today. The kind of atheism that I think our listener means is the kind of atheism that bears a striking similarity to that pre-Socratic conception of atheism. I think there's quite a bit more to say on this subject, so perhaps you'll join me for part two of this podcast. You've been listening to the Panorama Podcast with Dr. Lupu. I'm Matt Lupu. Thanks for listening.